Marilyn Robinson, the modern day novelist, wrote a beautiful book titled Gilead, which won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. And at one place in the book, she makes a striking statement. I want your thoughts on this, Pastor John. She writes this on page 52, quote, in eternity, this world will be Troy, I believe, and all that has passed here will be the epic of the universe, the ballad they sing in the streets, because I don't imagine any reality putting this one in the shade entirely, and I think piety forbids me to try, end quote. So what do you think? Will this life be a ballad of eternity? Obviously, there will be no tears, no regrets in heaven, but are there any biblical clues on the place of world history in eternity? I would love to know what she means by piety forbids me to try. I, I know what I mean when I say yes to your to your question because uh, I agree with her. At, at least insofar as I understand her, I agree with her. What, when uh, when Troy is mentioned, I mean, not everybody might get that. Tro- Troy was, was the city that the Greek states were um, attacking to try to capture, and it was a 10-year conquest, and Homer wrote the Iliad about it, and uh, the Iliad, I think, focuses pretty much on the last several weeks of that conquest, and, and Troy is captured, and, and so the, the bravery is heralded for generations to come, and the Odyssey is about the coming home of Odysseus, and so, it, in, in other words, it's a great a historical exploit that is told and written in poems for generations to come. And she's saying, uh, in the age to come, after Christ returns and the kingdom is established and the new heavens and the new earth are in place, the last thousands of years of church history that we are living in right now are going to be that that balladry. They're going to be that. that and, and I think that's right. So here, here's my, my reason. What is history for? What is history f- for? All your, this is uh, Psalm 145. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. All your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. And I want to say, what? Are they, they're just going to stop? <laughs> that <laughs> all of that is magnificently worth heralding now and it won't be magnificently worth worth heralding then i don't think so um what does what does christ's work mean when when i read in revelation 5 that uh, they are singing in heaven, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. They're singing that ages after the event in heaven. They're singing about the cross. Now, what's, what meaning could the cross possibly have in heaven if the history of redemption is forgotten? nothing it will be meaningless in in other words if you say what will be celebrated about jesus christ surely he will be celebrated for having fulfilled all the promises of the old testament surely he will be celebrated in ways we've never seen by fulfilling everything the history of redemption was all about surely he will be celebrated by being the ground and cause of every good thing that happened after him in the world and so if christ really is the center the apex of redemptive history for that apex to have its meaning then the rest of history of which it is the apex has to be known and understood and celebrated as well. And here's another pointer. Um, Revelation 15, 3, they sing in heaven, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and of the Lamb. Now, the song of Moses is, is Exodus 15, where they're singing about the triumphs of the people of God over Pharaoh. So if we're singing about the Lamb and we're singing the song of Moses, surely that is symptomatic of singing the songs of the triumphs of God in, in world history right down to the salvation of Tony Ranke. Surely, right? Why would your story not be told and not be remembered to the 
the praise and the glory of God. You're a trophy of grace. Well, I think I think those trophies are going to be walking around in the kingdom. And if, if, if you see a trophy on somebody's shelf, you say, what's that? And he tells you about the game, right? The game and the season when, when the trophy was, was won. Or here's another clue. Um, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says, so that each one may receive his due from the body what is good and what is evil. Well, if you're going to receive something for what was good... Though the good is going to be remembered and something is going to happen to you that will constantly call to mind the good. So there's another evidence or the 10 talents. You know, you're going to be serving over 10 cities. I'll be serving over five cities and there will be some explanation for that. And the explanation is it it has roots back in this age. Now, I, I think you asked also, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of sad stuff in this age and he's going to wipe away every tear. Okay, I, here's my take, and you can say this is speculative maybe, but I don't think Jesus is going to wipe away tears of joy. When he says every tear will be wiped away, he means painful tear, tear that is destructive and hurtful and paralyzing, and it makes my life miserable to have these tears and these memories. But if my, I mean, I'm sure most of our listeners will agree that the deepest joys have sometimes brought tears rather than laughter. Tears of stunned amazement that we've been treated so well. And, and those tears aren't going to be wiped away. They're beautiful. They're, you can see the sparkle of grace in those tears. And, and if you were to ask me, well, will there be regrets? Hmm. Uh, you know, for years, I have tried to put together two texts that I think gives an answer to this. One is uh, Philippians 3, where it says, forgetting what lies behind, we strain forward to the goal. So you're supposed to forget what lies behind. And the other is Ephesians 2 that says, remember that you were once separated from Christ. So you've got a command to forget and a command to remember. How do you put those together? I put them together like this. Every regret and every memory will be done away with that cannot serve your greater joy, cannot serve your greater love for Jesus, your greater valuing of grace. So he will wipe away every way of remembering, every way of regretting that ruins your joy in heaven and, and minimizes his mercy and, and minimizes his glory. But I think, Tony, that Marilyn Robinson is right that we have a great Troy in redemptive history and God will see to it that all the mighty works of grace done in the thousands of years leading up to the second coming will not be forgotten and yes she's probably right that piety should prevent us from wanting it to be forgotten. Yes, thank you, Pastor John. And thank you for listening to this podcast. Email your questions to us at askpastorjohn at desiringgod.org. You can visit us online at desiringgod.org to find thousands of books, articles, sermons, and other resources from John Piper, all free of charge. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Thanks for listening.